Hi, my name is Simon Howard and I am a Solution Architect at Microfocus. So this video is all about how you use SmartFix within FOD for Define Demand in order to be able to look and triage your issues quicker in your results. So right now what you see in front of you is a demo tenant that we use at Microfocus and you're looking at the applications view on this tenant. Here we see a list of the applications or some of the applications that have been scanned and one of them is an application called WG. If we go click on that we'll go into another view and we'll look at the various releases that have been scanned for this application. There are three releases that have been scanned and one that hasn't been assessed so far. And if you're not familiar with FOD, this little list over here of little boxes show you the different issues that have been found categorized into what we call buckets. Sometimes they're called criticality levels. So, for example, for version 3.0, which is the relate latest release that was scanned, there are 370 critical issues. And there are four and three high level issues. So let's kick on the high level issues. And let's go look at SmartFix and what it does. So in this view here, I'm going to see a breakdown of all the high-level issues, as underlined here, grouped at the moment by user. And I kind of like to group them by category, but there are lots of different ways in which you can group them. According to OSP to, uh, Top 10 categorization, for example, A1, A2, and so on. So here we can see now a list by category of all the vulnerabilities, high level vulnerabilities that were found. And there are, for example, 11 null dereference issues. If I click that little arrow there, I start seeing in a page view all those vulnerabilities. And one of them is in a file called blind script or Java line 267. This is a Java project. Then right in the center, I see a breakdown of information about this vulnerability. Now, normally in the triage process, I would go through the vulnerability tab, recommendations tab, and then look at my code and, and maybe look at a diagram to look at the data flow. But this video is about SmartFix. So I just want to highlight, though, what we mean by a null dereference. So this very straightforwardly shows you what we mean by null dereference. So an object called foo, in this case, of type foo, has been initialized to null. And then later on, the method called set bar is called. However, the possibility that foo might still be set to null. And if that's the case, something didn't happen that set up an instance of a foo object, a capital F foo object, if you see what I mean, then this call here would crash. And that might be a vulnerability. Resources might be leaked, for example. Now, in this particular case, if you look at the code tab, we can see information about a particular type of vulnerability, well, a vulnerability that was found. The vulnerability occurs at line 267. If I go select that, here it is down here. Now, I'm not going to go through this particular part of the interface, but I just wanted to go over the concepts. And I can see, if I go backwards through time, the code and data flow history that took me to that point. Now, there are 11 null dereference issues in, in this scan. And I can go to SmartFix and I can group them all together. This is exactly what SmartFix does. It shows me one single diagram, the instances in this particular case of null dereference issues. Now, actually, I can look at lots of different types of vulnerabilities, whatever category in, in using this drop down here. But at the moment, we're just looking at the null dereference issues. You'll notice that these little boxes, we call them nodes which are sort of no to the flow. Actually, they're the same things you saw in the code and data flow history earlier. And we, if you look, going from top to bottom, what you see, there are actually 11, corresponds to 11 issues, uh, start points here. We actually call them the source points, if you like. And at the bottom are the sinks that relate to those, those start points, the sources, if you like. The arrows, the green and... Uh, magenta arrow, uh, arrows or lines in this particular case show you the different flows. So if I select this, then I'm now looking at 
in really all the flows that go through that one particular point. It's a kind of hot spot if you like. If I click prune here, then now I'm looking at just those in this diagram, nothing else. So basically there are four different vulnerabilities that go through that point. And then they go elsewhere, if you see what I mean. And I'm just looking at one and right now, the one relating to this one here. You see it? It's in magenta. But I can click another one. Let's do that just to see what happens. And I'm going to now go and look in more detail at that vulnerability. So now we see a similar view to before, but we're just looking at this particular vulnerability, the same tabs as before. Let's go look at the code. Now, here's the history related to that. That actually corresponds directly to the line numbers here. You can see if I hover over that, you can see blindskip.java line 266 is, is um, mentioned. If we go here, that's the same point here. Now, here's the method that's involved. All of this action, if you like, when the code occurs within the method load me. If I click on the endpoint where the vulnerability actually occurs, that's the sync in our technology, then it occurs here. But it starts at line 248, which is here, right? So there is an array called parameter type, indexed by i, in this while loop here. And parameter type is set up here. Now, Recall a null dereference is where an object could be used, which might still be initialized to null. So what we're basically saying there's a way to get through the code where parameter type is still set to null. If you look carefully at the code, appreciate you won't know it. There is some two, or two if statements here, one after the other. One sets up parameter type and one sets up arglist, another variable here. But they're kind of intertwined in some way in this example. But if we just take parameter type on its own, what if we didn't go into this then part of the if statement here? We went into a non-existent else. Well, we could go then to line 254 and parameter type wouldn't be set up. Is it set up anywhere else? Now by set up in this case, I mean, do we create a new instance of an object of some sort or other and assign it to parameter type? So here that happens here at line 252 but it doesn't happen anywhere else. So if we didn't go into that then part, we went down into the while loop, we might get into this if statement, let's say, or maybe this one here at line 270, or maybe this one here at 274. And what we might do, or from a, what we might do is basically go into the then part and then manipulate uh, the parameter type object in XBI, i, whatever i is set to the iteration of the while loop, and do something, but of course, we might not have that might not have happened if we did, didn't go in here and that's exactly what 45 picked up in fact it picked it up for the other three instances or related instances of this type of vulnerability and that's what it's saying so basically we know there is a common spot here that's what this bit in red is saying to me where I might be all of these other spots here where I might be able to fix this vulnerability and if you look at the code if you think a little bit about it these two objects, parameter type and arglist, which are all related actually, uh, are set up here. But we don't really want to do anything because if you look at the code, if you pause the video to look at it in more detail, you'll see actually the main action, the main thing that happens in this method, if you like, is that we return uh, this thing ret object, which is set up here and that's based on the, the variable called meth there. If that isn't set up, then we return null. So the caller is probably set up to expect a value of null potentially in some error condition happening. So what actually what we want to do is to here round about line 258 is maybe put in an if statement that says if parameter type or arg list are equal to null, then actually I want to return null. Now I could return it there or I could do it perhaps a little bit more elegantly. But that's one common fix that will fix four issues and you can see that from smart fix. Okay, so that's that different type, one category of issue. Now, there's actually a lot of other sort of issues or categories of issue that's been found in this particular scan. For example, there's some cross-site scripting issues. There's a hundred of those of the type called reflected. Let's go look at those. So 
the diagram's refreshing right now. And here we really see the value of SmartFix when it refreshes. So right here, as you can see, a much bigger di diagram in terms of nodes. I'm going to zoom in, and straight away you might have noticed there's some orange there. That indicates to me some kind of hot spots, if you like. So I want to go and look at those straight away. Let's go and click one of those. You can see there is a lot of action related to those hotspots. And let's prune. Now zoom in again. Use my mouse to do that. And you can see there's some common spots here where I might be able to do some common fixes to fix quite a lot of issues. Actually, not the full 100, but quite a lot of them. So let's select one of them. Let's select this one here. And let's click and drill down into it. I'll close the other window while I'm at it. Now remember, this is a different type of issue. And I'll walk you through what we mean. So let's go look at the code. Actually, let's look, look at this window first. So here we're talking about a cross-site scripting reflected issue. And if we read the summary paragraph, we get a quick headline of what happened. So it says, in a method called make account line, in a file called SQL modify java.java, it sends unvalidated data to a web browser on line 167. Go on to the explanation part, it says some data enters the application through an untrusted source. Ah, right, straight away, I'm getting an idea that the data is coming in and I'm not validating it in some way or checking or making sure it's trusted. Whatever I need to do. So let's look at the code. So here's where this vulnerability starts, and some data comes in and is set up into an array called values. And the data comes in the variable called name. And you can see here that there's an object called values. Well, the, the, the array here is, is checked to make sure it's not null. If it is null, an exception is thrown. And if, if it isn't null, then we, it, the length is checked. But basically, there's no validation of that input other than that occurring. So potentially, an attacker could put in some characters or some string or something that could actually cause a problem. Cause of vulnerability, expose of vulnerability ultimately. So if we go to back to SmartFix itself, there are a lot of these doing exactly the same thing. So what we're saying here is that we've identified a place, or maybe it might be one of these other nodes down here, according to my design, where I might be able to implement a common fix that fixes several problems. And in, in this particular case, there are what at least ten vulnerabilities of that nature. You potentially could imagine you might have a, a particular set of vulnerabilities in your application. There might even be more that can be fixed. So straight away, you can see, I hope, the power of SmartFix and how it can be used to work and identify common fixes for your application. That's it. See you next time.